This is one that I have been thinking about for a few days. When I did this last on Wednesday, and we apologize, we weren't able to do one Thursday or Friday, but we're back and we're here, so no further apologies necessary. When I did this on Wednesday, there was a question about the Giants offseason hard knocks, and I hadn't watched it yet. I since watched it. Excuse me, I got a little piece of apple skin that got lodged in there because I really wasn't able to feel my lunch as I was eating it. I digress. So anyway, and I do eat an apple a day. An apple a day hopefully keeps the doctor away. Two apples a day, as they say, will keep two doctors away. So uh, anyway, I hadn't watched the offseason hard knocks focused on the New York Giants. I have since watched it twice. The first time I watched it was just like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah, okay. And then I slap on it and it's like, you know, there's some stuff in there that I really wouldn't be all that thrilled about if I'm the Giants. Now, it's insight more valuable than I thought it was going to be because they put some stuff out there that they probably probably shouldn't have out there. And I've got my list from the post that I did last week. I think it was Thursday, 4th of July in the morning. The six reasons why this might not be a great idea for anyone to want to do the offseason hard knocks. And, you know, the one place that I want to start, it relates to a question we asked Joe Shane, the Giants GM at the scouting combine about Saquon Barkley. At the time, the franchise tag window was open. We weren't sure what they were going to do. Are they going to tag him? Are they going to try to sign him? Is he going to stay? Is he going to go? Where's this all going to go? And Shane said, all options are on the table. I'm not saying we're going to tag him. We're not going to tag him. All options are on the table. Well, that's fine. And that's what you would expect him to say. But when you watch the first episode of Offseason Hard Knocks, it's clear they'd already made the decision they weren't going to tag him. So what he's saying to us isn't technically the truth. And that's not a criticism or an indictment of Joe Shane. That's the way it works. Do we really need to see the way it works? Do we need to have it confirmed? I mean, it's useful for my purposes because it supports my position whenever someone from a team says something and there are people in the media and fans who treat it as gospel truth it's like hang on hang on they tell us something other than the truth all the time to mesh with their strategic objectives this is a prime example of it they knew they weren't going to tag saquon barkley they knew they weren't going to tag and trade him they knew they were going to let him test free agency but for whatever reason they didn't say that at the scouting combine now i don't know why they didn't say it i don't know are they thinking that they're going to get some unexpected twist and they're going to see an opening or an opportunity to trade Saquon Barkley out from under the franchise tag. But that's just an example of the disconnect between what is said publicly and what is said privately for offseason hard knocks. After all the things that have been said publicly are said, we get a glimpse at some of the things that were said privately and they're not always going to mesh. And that's a reason why I wouldn't want to do it if I were the Giants or any other team. Give me preseason, give me in season. I don't want to do off season for that reason alone, because there's a lot of important decisions made, things said at press conferences and things said privately that might not mesh with what you've already said on the record. The question of the, the footage, the security, the sanctity, the things that land on the cutting room floor. That's one of the reasons former Patriots coach Bill Belichick never wanted to do hard knocks. It's one thing to say, oh, you've got full control over what gets into the final cut. That's fine. But what about all the stuff we took out? Where's that go? Where does that live? Who's got access to that? And when you consider the window in which this is all happening, January, February, March, April, we finally start seeing the episodes in July. That's a long time for all of the footage to be floating around in the NFL films virtual vault. And I have no reason to mistrust anyone connected to the process, but I wouldn't want to just trust everyone. I wouldn't want to just write a blank check that there isn't going to be one person who's got some nefarious agenda and uses that information against me, whether by leaking things that have been gathered through the hard knocks cameras and microphones to other teams or, or and this is something I don't think the NFL is nearly as concerned about as it should be misappropriating that. Inf- Let me try that again. Misappropriating Mr. Syllable or two 
in honor of Chris Sims, misappropriating that information. Let me try it again. It just sounds good when you say it right. Misappropriating that information for the purposes of wagering. Whether it's next snap taken by a player or who gets drafted where. Treasure trove of inside information about the Giants' plans. And I don't know who has access to it. That, that's consistent with a theme that I've mentioned several times before. We don't know who within a football organization knows what the plan is for a game. You know, somebody told me once, hey, they're in the coach's meeting room. They got the whiteboard. They're scripting plays. Who's coming in to empty the trash? Who's coming in to sweep the floor? Who just happens to be walking by and they stick their head in and they see the plays? That can all be used or misused and abused for gambling purposes. So that footage, because when you're doing preseason, it's captured and it's used. It's captured and it's used. It's quick. It's a, it's a one-week turnaround. This is months where this stuff's out there. And it's out there and no one sees it at a time when important decisions are being made. So while it's all in the hopper of things that could possibly be selected in the future for episodes, you've got free agency, you've got the draft, you've got important events, and you have people who know things. I don't know who it is that knows these things. If I'm the team that's doing this, I want to know the names of everyone. I want to know everything about everyone. I want to do a background check on everyone that's going to have direct or indirect access to this information or I'm not doing it. And the mere fact that I would have to do that tells me it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And that's what the Giants should have said. And that's what any team in the future should say. Another concern, and this played out as it related to this concerted effort to prop up Daniel Jones. Now, I wonder how different episode one and future episodes would have been if the Giants had moved on from Daniel Jones. But since they kept Daniel Jones the editing of Hard Knocks would be consistent with the idea that we love Daniel Jones. And one of the ways to support Daniel Jones is to blame someone else for his failures last year. That's where criticism was levied upon the offensive line and the backups who eventually were pressed into service. And Joe Shane made the comment along these lines. It's not an exact quote, but it's close. Patrick Mahomes survived behind that offensive line last year. So what that ends up becoming is frankly an issue for the offensive linemen who were there last year and who are coming back this year, especially the backups. You don't want that out there. You don't want to get called out through hard knocks by the general manager of the team. And if you're the Giants, do you really want to have to put out a little brush fire about this person or that person being upset during the slow time when you're otherwise on vacation? That's the other thing too. These are the weeks where they get away from all of it. They get a break. Well, oh, here's episode one of Hard Knocks on Tuesday, July 2nd. So if you're Joe Shane, if you're Brian Dayball, if you're John Mara, at a time when you're trying to get away from it, you're going to have reaction. You're going to have questions. You're going to have issues. You're going to want to spend time watching it. You're going to have to say, man, you know what? Did we blow that? What are we going to do about editing the next one? Should we make changes to the final cut of the next one based upon what got into the first one? I don't want any of that stuff. In my downtime, what's the point of that? Another one, and this relates to John Mara, the co-owner. You see how involved he was. He was talking in one scene directly to Joe Shane about Saquon Barkley, had some thoughts about that. I don't know if fans are upset or surprised by that or not, but I generally think that owners are far more involved than they want us to believe because when it goes sideways, they want to be able to blame somebody else. That's kind of why I appreciate and respect what Jerry Jones does in Dallas. He doesn't hire some figurehead to be the GM who will be fired if things don't go well, even though it's Jerry making the decisions. He owns it. He's out there. I remember him telling Bob Costas at one point that, and Costas asked a very good question along the lines of, would you have fired yourself as GM at any point over the past 20 years? And Jerry's like, well, yeah, but I can't. I'm the GM and I'm the owner. So I respect that he does that because a lot of these other owners want to be involved. They want to have a spoon in the stew and they want to be predominantly stirring the stew, but they want someone else to be responsible for the stew that goes bad. So 
again, how much Mara involvement do you show? How much do you not show? And that leads to another point that wasn't on my list from last week specifically, but to the extent that these teams still do have final say over what gets in. And I alluded to this last week, the Browns example, the Hugh Jackson, Todd Haley exchange about using veterans in training camp practices and it looked awkward and clumsy and it looked like Hugh Jackson was playing the I'm in charge here card and they thought it looked good. So they put it in. Most people looked at it and said, well, this is why the Browns are dysfunctional. So as my good friend, big cot, big cat, not big cot, but big cat taught me, I was trying to say taught and it came out caught instead of cat as my friend, big cat taught me, years ago, and I love this saying, dysfunctional teams do dysfunctional things. So if you are already dysfunctional, the function of selecting what goes in and what doesn't go into hard knocks can be affected by your organizational dysfunction. You assume that a team is going to properly exercise the sledgehammer or scalpel that is available to it for getting rid of things that shouldn't be in hard knocks. So that's another concern. Yeah, hey, I have final say. Am I using final say the right way? A couple of other ones real quickly. There was the stray comment, and I mentioned this in the story at PFT, about quarterback, if it's Daniel. I think it was one of the one of the Mara family members who's the director of player personnel. I can't remember his name other than he's one of the Mara family members. Uh, he says, well, quarterback, if it's Daniel when they're talking about what to do with Saquon Barkley. And that's just one of those little Freudian things that popped in, that made it through the filter, that undercuts this idea that they're all in with Daniel Jones. They clearly were thinking about a different path. And that stuff isn't going to be in. Not the way it should be. Not the way the we're thinking about moving on from Saquon Barkley stuff is going to be in, because they did move on from Saquon Barkley. And that's the last thing that I'll point out. There were a couple of interesting scenes about what to do at running back. And it was clear to me that Chris Rossetti, the director of pro scouting, thought they should try to keep Saquon Barkley and worst case scenario, tag and trade him. And he makes a comment in a January meeting right after the end of the Giants regular season that's prescient in hindsight that a team like the Eagles with that offensive line, maybe they would give up a draft pick or some other asset to trade for Saquon Barkley. Ultimately, they didn't have to. Then later in the episode, when they're meeting in Shane's office and they're having this conversation about what to do with Barkley, you get the impression that Rossetti wants to stand on the table and argue, we need to keep Saquon Barkley. And he states his case and he and Shane go back and forth a little bit. And it's very compelling because it's raw and it's real. I just don't know how good it is for the team to have that out there. It makes Rossetti look good. Hey, if, if Saquon has 1,500 rushing yards this year, Rossetti's going to be a general manager next year. This is great for him, and that's another reason to not do this. If you want to keep your talent in-house, if you don't want to get raided, we're, we're going to get to know people in the front office that we otherwise don't get to know. There's going to be a fan club for Chris Rossetti, especially if Saquon Barkley does well this year. But there's that part where he's just, you can tell. And they did a nice job of editing it. The truth percolated through the editorial process. And he was sitting there not saying anything. And you can just tell by his body language, he wanted to say more. And I wonder, did he hold his tongue because he's kind of the young guy and he knew he was being outnumbered and he'd spoken his piece and the momentum is taking the discussion away from the possibility of tagging Saquon Barkley. Did he do it just in deference to the fact that he was kind of the junior member of the conversation or, or did he hold his tongue because he knew it was being recorded and potentially it would be part of hard knocks. How far do you want to push it when you know everything you say can and will potentially be used in episode one, episode two, episode three, episode, I don't even know how many they're going to be of off season hard knocks. That's another reason to not do it. So, hey, I thought it was compelling because we shouldn't have seen all that stuff and we shouldn't have heard all that stuff and no team should want to do it. I'd much rather do training camp hard knocks. I'd much rather do in-season hard knocks. This off-season hard knocks is a problem. The bottom line is 
as long as the NFL is going to keep looking for places in the pizza to stuff cheese with hard knocks this and hard knocks that and hard knocks the other, someone's going to have to do it. And I think the Giants, as the test case slash guinea pig for offseason hard knocks, providing the rest of the league with plenty of things to not do and plenty of things to be sensitive about as it relates to how much of what is said in these meetings will make its way onto the final product. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.